<coughs> how you can actually group different elementary constituents, that is the quarks and the leptons in different group, based on how they are behaving or how they're talking uh, under that particular kind of group. And we also realize that apart from the elementary particles, we also need uh, fundamental interaction because that is how these different elementary entities are talking with each other. And in order to make it happen, we also need fundamental force carrier. And we realize that they are in terms of the gluons, which are responsible for the media, I mean, which are the mediators of the strong interaction. Then we have photons, which are mediators of the electromagnetic interaction. And finally, we have blue and the G, <coughs> the mediator of the weak interaction. So we also briefly discussed that uh, there is a problem in the standard model. That is that in order to respect those symmetries, I mean, if you go back a few slides uh, back, then so in these slides, as we discussed during the last class, that a bilinear term in the A field is actually forbidden. If you assume certain kind of symmetry that is chi prime is going as chi e to the power i alpha x, where alpha is a kind of so for simplicity, I just consider here a one dimensional case. And alpha is something which has a space dependence. So it is not a pure constant. So if you have something, uh, a transformation like this, then of course you need to have a kind of compensating transformation also in the A field. For the moment, I'm not keen to say what are the nature of A and whatever. It's just a kind of vector. So unless this transformation is there, of course, uh, I missed a vector sign on alpha prime, which is d alpha dt. <clears throat> Put it to have that thing. Uh, so, any bilinear terms in A is forbidden if we have this particular symmetry in Shai. And that means that in the standard model, where all the elementary particles, as you can see here, they are grouped together or clubbed together on the basis of more than one symmetry principles. Now, it turns out that those symmetry principles, they actually forbid the appearance of any bilinear terms in those respective entities. For example, a pair of quark field, a pair of electron field. So they are forbidden. But experimentally, as you can see from this slide, that the top quark, for example, it is very heavy and the mass is of the order of 173.1 dV. For the moment, as I told earlier, that I would prefer to work in the unit of the natural unit system where h car or h bar and c is equal to one. So these are pretty massive. And even if you take a look at the w and the z bosons, they also have masses in the ballpark of 100 GeV. So the big question is that the symmetry principles, which are responsible for grouping them together or which, is, or which are the building blocks of the standard model, I mean, which are the foundations of the mathematical structure of the standard model, they do not allow any kind of bilinear term. So that means if we are trying to formulate a mathematical structure for the standard model of elementary particles, then as per this model, all the entities of the standard model must remain massless. That is from the theoretical construction. But now when you move to the experiment, and if you take a look at the experimental fact, we see completely different things. For example, we realize that most of the standard model particle, it is true that there is a huge hierarchy in their masses. And for example, the electron is only half MeV, whereas if I go to top, that is 173.1 GeV. So there is a huge hierarchy. But except the neutrinos, which are massless as of the original standard model and photon and gluons, all other standard model particles are massive. So the question that we are going to answer today, or we're going to prove today, that how the so-called Higgs is responsible for the mass generation through which mechanism. So this is the main part of the, today's talk. And after that, as suggested by the title of today's talk that we will also discuss that what are the problems on the standard model and why you need to look beyond the standard model. Of course, I'm not going to discuss 
about i mean i will just briefly mention what are the possible candidates theory which can explain physics beyond the standard model without going into details so this is where we stopped and let us start from here so as i mentioned that excess photons gluons and the neutrinos neutrinos are massive as of now but when Glasso, Weinberg, and Salam they formulated the theory of the standard model. At point of time, neutrinos were exactly massless. So, except these few entities, all other standard model particles are massive, and these are experimentally proven facts. Now, this is a clear contradiction of the symmetry principle of the standard model. So, theory is suggesting massless particles, whereas experiment is giving us that everything is messy except a few entities. So how to make a connection between these two, these two facts? Both are correct. So how to digest these apparently contradicting facts? So for that, we need to use two principles. First is the theory of continuous symmetry breaking and followed by the Higgs mechanism. So although normally the theory of the spontaneous breaking i mean uh, after the discovery of higgs i mean it has i mean it is named after the peter higgs but you must remember that the theory was not developed by him alone in fact the theory was i mean the theory as we see now is a continuous is the result of a continuous effort from several pioneer scientists in this field so it all started the anderson in the condensator field and then Brout, Englert, Guranlin, Hagen, Cable, Higgs, and finally Tooth. And the thing is that, so if you go and take a look at the history of those famous papers, all these three papers were formulated during 1964 November. So often in the history of particle physics, we actually label it or rename it as the November Revolution. So all these three pioneering papers, which are connected to his mechanism, were formulated during that time. So there were three sets of paper, one by Peter Higgs alone, the other one is by Brout and Englert, and the other one is by Gudan, Ling, Hagen, and Cable. But as you all know, that eventually, because Brout died, so eventually the Nobel Prize goes to Englert and Peter Higgs. So, now let us try to see that why symmetries are important and how to break symmetry. So I will start with a very naive example, uh, not connected with the particle physics, but something connected with our day-to-day -day life. So for example, suppose six or seven of you are invited in a round table dinner. Now, before sitting, if you take a look at the top image, it is, so there are like, seven glasses but as long as the table is unoccupied it is impossible to see that which glass goes with which sitting but the moment one of you act like a volunteer and decided to opt a chair at the very moment this pattern became unique because now i know which glass belongs to which person so here it's a very kind of crude example but here you see that because of your participation which is also in a sense continuous because in the given example every single setup which you can see here they're identical it is not that one glass is made up of gold and the remaining are made up of glass so that actually it, you know it gives you the freedom like i could go and choose this one it's not like that it was completely random what we can do we can actually try to make it more uh, yes please more realistic now in the context of the particle physics or in the context of the physics so symmetries are extremely important in the context of physics why so let us consider a generic potential of course, constraint in the context of the one dimension. Since I would like to write a generic potential, there is a reason why I have kept terms of the order of X4, but I don't want to dig into that. But suppose 
I would like to keep terms of the order of x4. So this is a genetic polynomial up to the fourth order. Now, after writing this potential, you say, no, I want to apply this potential in the context of a, such a system where I have a reflection symmetry. That is x going to minus x leaves the potential invariant. The moment you have this kind of assumption, you see that C1 and C3 force to be zero. C0 is a mayor constant. You know, I can always absorb this by a redefinition of the origin. If so, that is in the context of a real X. But if I would like to make it much more general, and that is precisely what we do in the context of the particle physics, as we will see subsequently. Suppose now I want to do the same thing, say in the context of Z, but Z is a complex number, Z plus X plus I Y. So now you can see that if I want to write terms that are invariant under Z going to E to the power I alpha Z, where I A Z, sorry, not alpha, where this A is not a constant, but it is something which also depends on at which position you are measuring it. It is exactly like something which we did uh, in few slides uh, earlier, or especially we discussed during the last class, when we actually consider this alpha prime, that is nothing but the derivative of alpha with respect to x. I think in the beginning of the class by mistake, I said it d alpha dt, it's not d alpha dt, it's d alpha dx. So here you can see that such a transformation, z going to e to the power i a z, leaves this particular potential invariant. Now there is a genetic question that given this kind of symmetry, is it not possible to add a cubic term in this case? Of course, you cannot add a cubic term which are trilinear in Z because that is going to spoil the symmetry. But if you have a term which is a combination of three different Z, for example, as I wrote here, Z1 star, Z2 and Z3, and then if you apply a suitable transformation and there is the relation between the corresponding uh, transformation A, B and C, you can still keep this term invariant. And this HC is nothing but a fact that is the Hermitian conjugate because at the end of the day, I want to keep my potential real because I'm going to associate this with some physical system. So that is the reason I have considered the Hermitian conjugate to keep it real. But you see, under this particular kind of transformation, a cubic term, I can add this also in the potential. Now, I'm not going to probe this further, but I just gave this example of this trilinear term because this is precisely what you will see later when you are going to study the actual particle physics using the quantum field theory. This is the basic structure of the Yukawa interaction, where you have one left chiral object, one right chiral object, and the Higgs field. And their individual transformation or symmetry properties are assigned in a way so that the overall term remain invariant under this set of transformation. And only then I can add this term in my Lagrangian formulation or in my Hamiltonian formulation. Because when I'm writing down the Lagrangian level themes or the Hamiltonian theme, I would expect this to remain invariant under this kind of transformation. Otherwise, because we are associating this with some physical properties. Otherwise, if they are not invariant under this set of transformation, then the problem is that your physical quantity, which is a measurable thing, it started showing explicit dependence on the particular chosen values of a, that is something not desired and that is something we haven't observed till now. For example, all these things which I just mentioned and as we will see or subsequently is in the context of the mass generation. Now you know, if you for the moment forget about the relativistic effect, the rest mass of the electron we know that is actually half a million. Now, if instead of having a formulation like that, if it started showing explicit dependence of the constant parameter, then if you keep on doing 20,000 different experiments, you would expect different masses of the electron, but that is not consistent with our experimental observation. So 
whenever you are writing a terms in the lagrangian level or in the uh, in the hamiltonian level it should remain invariant under this set of transformation and that is the reason if i apply three consecutive transformation a b and c in order to keep this term invariant under this kind of e to the power i theta kind of transformation i must use the relation c is equal to a minus b and that is the only way to keep this invariant so moving further now let us try to see that what is the idea of this continuous symmetry breaking but in the context of the particle physics as i will elaborate further in subsequent slide we are considering a particular kind of so earlier when i gave this example of this glass and seven cells how to choose the glass it was completely spontaneous or like random so that is the reason why you are actually calling it spontaneous because it is not driven by any external agent and now i am going to give you a more real free example which is much more uh, applicable or connected to a physical system suppose you are holding a pencil like this like this and you are keeping like this now i know that as long as i am holding this pencil like this a pen like this it will remain there but wait a minute the pen is standing like this because it's an unstable position and i'm holding it even if i leave my hand and i try to like to do some kind of zigzag balancing the probably the pain will stay there but that is not a kind of stable position eventually it will lie down but when it's going to lie down as you can see if i let it go the chance of having the pencil or the pain in a particular direction is completely random because from the viewpoint of this pencil this gray shaded area where the radius of this gray area is equivalent to the length of this pencil any particular position is equivalent because all of these possible or any particular position in this gray circle are equally possible with ground state so in terms of the physics language you can say that there is a rotational invariance of the ground state so as long as i am holding the pencil like this picture a from the viewpoint of the pencil there is a infinite possible many ground state but the moment i let it go it will drop and it will eventually be in any specific direction that is completely random but the moment it is in a specific direction the rotational invariance of the ground state which were visible in the context of diagram a is no longer there it's gone so that is the reason we call is a spontaneous symmetry breaking of the ground state spontaneous because it is not driven by any external agent that is the lowest possible energy state so it is natural for any system to be its lowest possible energy state and the moment a particular ground state is chosen the symmetry which were associated with all other possible ground state it is broken and that is precisely what is known as the spontaneous symmetry breaking in the ground state so the overall theory it remains invariant under that symmetry operation whatever be the symmetry associated with it for example here in the context of this example the rotational symmetry but it is the ground state which actually breaks the symmetry spontaneously not the entire system it is only the energy of the ground state when it actually picks up a particular direction broken spontaneously and we will study this in more detail giving some nice graphical example in order to do that i just consider a simple potential where vx is c1 x square plus c2 x square so these are mathematically generated plot now for this particular problem i have considered c1 is equal to 1 and c2 is equal to 0.1 and i have tried to discuss you know four different possible configuration just to give a better idea of which is the viable configuration and only when you can actually get spontaneous symmetry breaking of the ground state so suppose i consider the c1 positive and c2 negative which is given by this particular plot i hope my mouse pointer is visible so now you can see that here the problem is that if i keep the ball here it is fine 
but this is not the position of the minimum energy the minimum energy position is actually here so if i let a ball roll it will roll down to infinity because the problem associated with this kind of state is that these are the system which are known as infinitely so it is unbounded from below because this can go all the way up to infinity if you keep on increasing the value of x i mean you are going to get negative and more negative and more negative value of the vx and there is no limit so these are unbounded from below and these are not physical example of a valid physical system because here if the system is unbounded from below then how on earth you can define your ground state energy the minimum and the situation is similar if you actually consider a system where both c1 and c2 are negative here also the system remains unbounded from below now if we consider this plot that is the third plot or the bottom plot of the left side you see here both c1 and c2 they are positive the beauty of this thing is that this is precisely something similar to a kind of part of harmonic oscillator but the beauty of this thing is that as you can see that here the ground state is uniquely defined and that is at x equal to 0 but this is less impressive because this is not going to serve the purpose of the spontaneous breaking of the ground state because here as you can see that the ground state is really uniquely defined but if i go to a configuration where c1 is negative but c2 is positive i can actually have a potential like this this is really interesting because now x is equal to 0 is not a minima but this is a maximum the minima actually lies somewhere else it of course it depends actually on the particular value of the c1 and c2 you can start playing with different other values of ci's and you can get different values but the interesting fact is that now you can see instead of one now i have two degenerate ground state and both of these ground state are equivalent if i let a particle sit here for a moment then this ground state or this ground state, they are exactly identical. And there is a priori no reason to pick up one over the another. So if after some time the particle decides to be here, it is completely random. But the moment the particle rolls down and be in one of these possible configurations, the symmetry of the ground state is broken. But the symmetry of the overall theory remains intact. It is only the ground state where the symmetry is continuously broken. And that is the heart of the spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism following which one needs to apply Higgs mechanism in order to get the mass generation. And now I give you the very precise example, which is exactly the same as I discussed here. But here I discuss in the context of a one dimensional problem but in the context of the particle physics, this phi, they are actually field. So field means it is a quantity which has continuous variation over the space time. Now I also need to include time because this is a relativistic formulation. So I have to take ax and t with the equal footing. And you can, if you take a look at this v phi, it precisely has the same structure as of the fourth uh, example where c1 is less than 0 and c2 is greater than 0. So in this example I have a coefficient mu square which is appearing with this quadratic term and lambda is the coefficient which is appearing with the quartic term and both mu square h and lambda are greater than 0. Now because now I am working in the context of the real particle physics so this phi it is no longer just a kind of wave function. It is actually a field, but it is actually a complex scalar doublet under some symmetry. You forget about all these details. Why it is doublet? Because it has a structure like this. You can think about this as a two cross one column matrix. And why complex? Because each of these entries can be expanded as a real plot plus i times the imaginary part. So there are basically four real fields but two complex scalar fields. 
and naturally if i would like to make a plot of this now it is going to be much more complicated compared to the the previous example that we did in the last but the physics remains the same so instead of having two ground states which you can see here now i am going to have infinitely many so which are actually along this circle or where this blue ball is sitting so as long as my so you can think about this as ourselves so as long as we are here from this point the ground state is completely symmetric and in fact there are infinitely many ground state each and every point in this hypothetical circle their equally valid member to be a possible ground state but this cannot be a stable position because the energy is higher here so at some point of time the particle or we will roll from here and we'll be sitting in one of this state but the moment we are here it is one particular position so this infinite possible ground state out of this infinite possible many ground states we have now picked up one how completely random so that is the art of continuous symmetry breaking and this is the you can say the starting point because unless we have this continuous symmetry breaking we cannot actually apply the uh, the so called higgs mechanism which is responsible for the mass generation and there is also something very interesting for this kind of symmetry breaking we always need to deal with the complex object because if you would like to do with the real object there are certain uh, uh, complexities if you try to work it out you will realize immediately for example you can try to apply this idea in the context of these things because here also the spontaneous symmetry is broken but here we have a reflection symmetry x going to minus a whereas here we have a rotational symmetry because here phi i mean the the symmetry that we are actually applying here x to minus a but the symmetry that we are applying here is phi going to e to the power some i alpha times phi so that is important now i would like to show you explicitly just by giving a very simple example how the spontaneous symmetry can serve the purpose of the mass generation so this is an elementary example but we will have a more dedicated example later so suppose consider once again a potential in one dimension which looks like this but here unlike the first example i have explicitly put a minus sign and if you remember all the lecture notes uh, or the slides that i have discussed i kept on telling this thing that in the context of the field theory or quantum field theory if you have a term which is bilinear in that field so if you consider higgs field phi phi square if you consider x in this particular example x square they are some things which represent the master so this is something like a master but the problem is this minus signs is not the correct sign of a mass why that you will see later and i have this lambda by 4 factorial x put term so this is like a kind of perturbation and i have also intentionally added this constant term which is constant Uh, because mu and lambda they are constant so i have intentionally added this term just to have this particular shape so that at uh, if i put x is equal to 0 vx is not equal to 0 and it turns out to be the maximum so if you actually plot this potential for this particular value mu square is equal to 2 and lambda is equal to 0.24 so these values are not randomly chosen these values are chosen from the basis of the first example because this example i mean if you put those uh, this two values then you are going to get precisely equivalent to c1 is equal to 1 and c2 is equal to 0.1 so those are the my motivations of considering those particular values but now once again as before as you can see that there are degenerate ground states they are not located at x equal to 0 but they are located at x equal to x not where the value of the x not is actually determined in terms of the bayer parameter or the the model parameter mu square and lambda but 
what I can do, because now my ground state is not at x is equal to zero, but at x is equal to x naught, what I can do, I can expand my theory around x is equal to x naught. Why? You can actually ask me, because the thing is that we normally always prefer to expand our theory around the ground state, which is the state of minimum energy, so that I can identify the energy levels uniquely and unambiguously. So that is the motivation. And if the moment you do that, if you start expanding around x is equal to plus minus x naught, you are going to get a term like this. Now, you can ask me that what was the motivation of doing this simple exercise? One, as you can see, now the coefficient of the quadratic term, it actually appears with the correct sign, that is plus. So now I can identify this with the mass like term for this x. Of course, here it is not a field, it is just a simple thing. But to give you the, the story, if you are interested, even if you are working in the x dimension, I mean, in one dimension, and you also consider that x is a, a function of t, you can write it down as a zero plus one dimensional field theory, but I'm not going to go into that detail. But the most interesting part is that now the appearance of a cubic term. And that terms explicitly shows you that the starting symmetry, x going to minus x, is no longer here. Because this particular potential, when you expand around x is equal to x naught, it is not symmetric under x going to minus x. But the original potential was, sy was symmetric with respect to x going to minus x. So the take home story is that the original symmetry of x going to minus x is now no longer there when we have shifted our origin and have expanded around x is equal to x naught. So by doing the theory once again, but just not with respect to x is equal to zero, with respect to x is equal to x naught, which is the position of the shifted origin, you can see that we are getting interesting things. And this is precisely a very nice example what you can do if you start with a potential of the X field, which is precisely like this. So there also you are going to get the this, this minus terms, which are going to give you the mass term with the correct sign after the spontaneous symmetry breaking. You are also going to get the cubic term, which will be cubic in the Higgs field that is responsible for Higgs, Higgs, Higgs kind of cubic interaction. And of course, there will be a four Higgs interaction. That for that, you need to know a little bit of field theory. And now I would like to give you something which is more interesting. So once again, I am continuing with the same example, but instead of giving too many new information, I have decided to keep this talk as also advised by your teacher kept in, I mean, to keep it in the more elementary level so that you have a better idea before you jump into the world of the actual particle physics. So let us go back to this example once again, which is the original example where I have a potential which is symmetric with respect to x going to minus x that is symmetric with respect to the reflection symmetry. And v at zero is not equal to zero, which is rather the minimum, rather the maximum, but the actual minima, the degenerate minima, they are sitting at x is equal to x naught, where x naught is plus minus some square root of 6 square by lambda. But now when you expand with respect to this new minima, that is x is equal to x naught, plus minus x naught, of course, you have a new potential where that original symmetry is broken. And now what is interesting you started with this, but it turns out that now you have a pair of simple harmonic oscillator around x is equal to x naught for small x, because only for the small x, you can for the moment drop term like x cube and x four. And in fact, as long as x is small, you can consider x cube and x four as the perturbative effect. So the original symmetry x going to minus x is gone. and now you can see that you have two degenerate ground state which are given 
uh, or which are represented by two different color. One is for x not greater than zero, and the other is for x not less than zero. And now you can see that I can rewrite my theory once again with respect to the new ground state. And as long as x is not too large, I'm not going to face any serious problem. Of course, when x is large, you can see that there is a significant, as shown by this bottommost figure, you can see a significant deviation from the simple harmonic oscillator like potential. And that is also well expected because at the end of the day, why this curve is there? Because this is nothing but this line and this is the other is not, this is, is going to give you this slope. So if you go to the large X, of course you are going to reproduce this thing. But as long as you consider small X, I can have a pair of mildly part of simple harmonic oscillator and I can do or I can rewrite my entire theory with respect to one of these ground state B is F not greater than zero or F not less than equal to zero. But of course, there are few things if you consider higher X, then that symmetry is gone. And why that symmetry is gone, that is also obvious because if you are here, I hope all of you can see my mouse because that is important. You can see my mouse. Is it visible? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. So this X going to minus its symmetry, it remains as long as you are actually in the ball uh, in the regime of small x so when i'm here i can see it's a perfect x going to minus x symmetry but when i'm actually moving further you see the shape of the potential changes drastically and there this x going to minus x symmetry is not at all apparent and that is precisely what you can see when you go to the large x limit of course one word of caution whenever you have degenerate backward and we are considering a kind of uh, quantum mechanical theory. So of course, there is the possibility of quantum mechanical tunneling, but that is something I have neglected in this calculation. So this particular example, which I discussed till now, this is the very basic idea, which we apply also in the context of the particle physics, starting with a potential, which looks like this, and the treatment, that I did here, that is precisely the same. And at the end of this system, you not only going to get a ground state, which where the original symmetry is broken, on top of that, you are going to get new interaction, which we have detected experimentally. And before I move further, I would just like to discuss a little bit more with the naive example, the, so, so far I have discussed the art of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, how this is going to give you a mass term of, uh, with correct sign and how the ground state no longer, I mean, and how the ground state loses its original symmetry. But fine, but now the question is that this is all about spontaneous symmetry breaking. Whatever we did, we realized that this has produced a kind of correct sign master for the X. So X was a kind of naive example. So if you just make a one and one mapping, so this is like the master for the X. But wait a minute, our starting assumption or the starting goal was not there. It was the mass generation for all other particles, which is something that we need to discuss. And that is precisely what I'm going to do subsequently. So now I consider some hypothetical particle which is moving in a complex plane. And as you can see, the potential remain exactly the same. And this first term, which is uh, circled by the red bracket, this is nothing but the, the kind of kinetic term. And then you have the potential. And as you can see that the choice of potential is once again, such that it is symmetric or invariant under a transformation like this. But the kinetic term is not invariant. So this is something I discussed long back in the context of this uh, shy prime going to e to the power i a shy kind of thing. So of course, if you work it out, you're going to see something like this. But it turns out that 
instead of starting from this term, if I can manage somehow to write down a kinetic term like this, where B is some another parameter just like A, and X is some random field, and then you can see that this particular kinetic terms remain invariant under Z prime going to E, a z and x prime going to x plus one by b d a d t, which is really surprising. Now the funny thing is that if I start with this particular kinetic terms, it remains invariant under z going to e to the power i a z. And more interestingly. A term like C1 dx dt is invariant under this transformation given that d2a dt2 is zero. So when I am doing this thing, you can ask me that whatever you are doing, it's all mathematics, fine. But when I actually apply these things, so in the back of my mind, I have something similar to that. What do we, uh, what is this, this uh, I mean, this gauge fixing kind of condition. So this is nothing but analogous to the 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 delta two of alpha, which you can determine in the context of this magnetic vector potential, equal to zero. So that is that was the how I have derived this quantity. Now, what is the motivation for doing this thing? The motivation for doing this thing is that I just wanted to show you that if you consider d two a d t two is equal to zero, then a term like c one d x d t is also an eligible entry for this particular theory. And that is also important because dx dt is going to determine the dynamics of the x field or this whatever quantity associated with the x because dx dt is going to determine its evolution with time. So that entry is important. When you are going to do the field theory, you will realize, or when you are going to study the relativity in detail, you are going to see that this is equivalent to F mu nu, F mu nu kind of term. But since my hands are tied, because I don't want to go into all those details, so I have just tried to give you a kind of toy or trivialized example to see that how this term can appear in the Lagrangian or in the Hamiltonian because that is invariant under the given symmetry. But wait a minute, a term which is quadratic in X is not allowed in that theory because this is not invariant under the particular say transformation of X. So quadratic term in X doesn't obey this symmetry. So if instead of starting from here, if you ask me to write down a theory which is invariant under Z going to E I A Z. I would start from here. And also I need this additional transformation of X. And I can also add a term which is quadratic in the time derivative of X. So the dynamical evaluation of the X has been taken into account. But I cannot add a term which is purely quadratic in X because that is not allowed by this particular symmetry. And this is precisely how the masses of the photon, gluons, W bosons are forbidden in the theory of the standard model to start with. Of course, the underlying symmetry principles are much more complicated. Now, if you move further with that, you can again do the same exercise as I did in the as I did in the context of this example with X you can actually shift the origin and re-expand around Z0. If you do that, you will see now, starting from this term, you will get a, quad, a quadratic term, a quadratic term in X, which looks like A B square X naught square two by X square. And this term is quadratic in X and that is precisely how the mass terms for the W and Z bosons appear in the standard model. The four. But it's a beauty if you try to apply the same tricks also in the context of the photons and gluons, because of the 
associated symmetry principle, they remain massless. So the, uh, the rough rule is that if a symmetry is broken, the corresponding, uh, the, uh, the mediator particles, which are associated with it, they become massive. If a symmetry is unbroken, the particles or the mediator associated with that symmetry, they remain massless. And that is precisely the case because electromagnetic symmetry is unbroken in nature, as I have discussed uh, in the, during the last lecture, just by giving you a trivialized example that why in the nature, we can't see objects moving freely and carrying fractional charges. That is the reason why electron, we can see a free electron, but we can't see a free quark because it is carrying a fractional electric charge. And because electromagnetic symmetry remains unbroken in nature, that is the reason why photon is massless. So in the nature, we are going to see only quantized electrical charge, zero, one, two, plus minus one to be precise, plus minus two and things like that. Similarly, in an analogous way, the color symmetry, it is also not broken by nature. And that is the reason in the nature, we cannot see any free moving colored object. That once again justifies why you can't see a free quark moving here and there. But object that are composite states of quark, they are color neutral in nature and we can observe this. And that is once again, something I mentioned during the last lecture, that is what I cannot see a free U quark, but I can see a proton because it is the composition of the UDD and their color charges are organized or their color uh, uh, charges are organized in a way so that overall it appears a color neutral object. Similar logic also holds true for a neutron. Neutron is color neutral, but some things which are inside the neutrons, they are not color neutral, they are colored object. So since I have already covered enough amount of material, I'll just take a pause and if you have any questions, you can ask me. Before moving further. Any question? Because I have tried to oversimplify, uh, like uh, to make everything oversimplified, only, you know, uh, working in the context of the known physics, not introducing some things which is beyond your graphs. No questions? Okay, so let me move further. So what actually happens now we are actually in the standard model. So after giving all these toy examples to show you how precisely you are expanding around the shifted origin and how that can give you not only the masses, but it can help you to have, to move from a theory with massless objects to a theory with massive objects, keeping some symmetries unbroken and as a consequence, some of the particles associated with those symmetry remains massless. So what actually happens that in the standard model, there are unbroken some symmetries. So one of them is the weak symmetry and the other is some symmetry, which is labeled as the hypercharge symmetry. Now each of symmetry, they have their own mediator particles. Now as we have already realized that to start with, when the symmetry is, I mean, to start with, I'm not thinking about the ground state now, to start with in that theory, a term which is quadratic in those fields, they are forbidden. Why? That is something we have explicitly studied. This is precisely why you cannot have a quadratic term in capital X squared to start with. So that is the reason to start with all these bosons, they are massless. And for the massless bosons, there are only two possible states of polarization, the transverse polarization, which is schematically shown like um, by this diagram. 
And if there are two polarization, so each of these polarization is equivalent to one degrees of freedom written as DUS. So four of them, that means four times two, total eight degrees of freedom. Wait a minute. On top of that, to start with, you have also the Hick sector in your theory. And if you go back a few slides, and if you take a look at my Higgs potential, you see I mentioned here that it is a complex scalar doublet under some symmetry. And I have also explained doublet because it has a metric structure. So it's a two component object and complex because each entries are complex. So there are actually two complex scalar means four real scalar. And degrees of freedom associated with each object real object is one. So that is the reason to start with, I have four degrees of freedom from the Higgs sector. Forget about their leveling because this is just a way to understand how it is happening. So to start with, I have four massless mediator for the weak sector and for the hypercharged sector. So four into two eight and plus four degrees of freedom from the Higgs sector. So altogether, 12 degrees of freedom. What happens after the spontaneous symmetry breaking at the his mechanism that certain combinations of those of those massless mediator they actually start eating one of the Higgs field. So what is the physical meaning of eating? The physical meaning of the eating that they basically adopt one degrees of freedom that initially was available with uh, Higgs inside them. So earlier, they all were two degrees of freedom. But when you adopt one more degrees of freedom, you have now three degrees of freedom. So they already had two transverse degrees of freedom but just you know eating one more degrees of freedom from the higgs now they have three degrees of freedom and the third one which they have inherited or adopted or snatched away from the higgs is the much needed longitudinal degrees of freedom and whenever there are three degrees of freedom they are no longer massless but they are massive mediators particle so certain combination of w1 and w3 w2 sorry appears as our charge w plus boson to be very precise it is w1 minus i the complex number w2 by square root of 2 and if you just consider charge conjugate of that it will give you w minus now the formation of the z boson is a bit tricky here the w3 it is neutral so it is not going to participate with w1 and w3 but what it did because of its electrical neutral nature it actually it mixes with part of the hypercharge mediator and they actually adopt one degrees of freedom from one of the neutral hits and now this particular mixed combination of the W3 and B, it is known as the Z0 boson or our Z boson, which has a mass of the order of 91.8 GeV. And the W mass is of the order of 80 in the unit of C is equal to one for W plus and W minus, the mass is around 80.385 GeV. But what is the beauty is that the other combination of this w3 and b the orthogonal combination to be precise this is something that appears as the photon and it remains massless so that is the beauty of this formulation so one combination which is comprised of w3 and b it appears massive 
but the other orthogonal combination and that is why this orthogonality is needed it is orthogonal and it remains massive and that overall new sector gives you three gauge bosons all massive so they have three times three nine degrees of freedom i have photon which is still massless so i have two degrees of photon so nine plus two eleven and finally i have the much needed the higgs particle and this is a scalar so with one degrees of freedom so the initial 12 degrees of freedom which were available like 4 into 2 plus 4 now redistributed as 3 into 3 plus 2 plus 1 so we started with three massless mediator for the weak sector one massless mediator for the hypercharge sector and four massless entries from the higgs sector now we ended up with three massive gauge bosons w plus w minus and z one massless gauge boson which is or one massless mediator which is photon and a massive scalar higgs which has one degree of freedom so nine plus two plus one so once again we have 12 degrees of freedom so this is precisely how the gauge bosons the with gauge bosons, they acquire their masses from the after the spontaneous electric breaking and the Higgs mechanism. So you can ask me that Higgs mechanism is this when actually they are eating or snatching one of the degrees of freedom from the Higgs sector. Now, how this is possible? Because the symmetry of the ground state is already broken, and because the symmetry is broken nothing forbids them to pick up a master the overall theory is massless ground state is no longer symmetry and that is the reason now they are massive with respect to the ground state and of course if you go back to this slide you can actually write down the eruka interaction like this where this v1 as i just mentioned while ago will be your left chiral fermion field. Don't get into the detail. I'm not going to get into the details. This is will be the uh, another kind of, uh, so this is basically going to be the left-handed electron, the right-handed electron, and this is going to be the Higgs field. So once again, if you do the art of continuous symmetry breaking followed by the Higgs mechanism, then you can get your desired lepton and quark masses through the Yukawa interaction because that trilinear terms was precisely the structure of the Yukawa interaction. Now you can ask me that if that is true, then how one are the neutrinos remain massless? To understand that, you have to understand one thing that the way, because we have seen, so what is this handedness? This is some kind of notion. I mean, uh, for that, uh, you need to learn about more things like helicity or chirality i'm not going to go into that details but it is some kind of way of defining i mean it turns out that the the elementary particles they have some kind of handedness so when a left-handed and the right-handed object they are together along with the higgs field three of them together they comprise a yuka interaction then after this continuous symmetry making followed by higgs mechanism it gives you massive elementary particles. But it turns out that for the neutrinos, as of now, we haven't discovered anything or any neutrinos which has this right handedness. As of now, no. So that is the reason the way we can generate masses for other elementary particles, all other leptons and quarks we cannot apply the same trick for the neutrinos. So they still remain massless in the context of the original standard model proposed by Glasgow, Weinberg and Salah. And of course, as I just mentioned, that that is the reason why they live in massless and gluons, they're associated with the color symmetry. It is a symmetry which remains unbroken. And because this, it remains unbroken, so the corresponding force mediators they also remain massless. So at the end of the spontaneous symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism, you have massless leptons and quarks, excluding neutrinos, 
you have massive W and Z vessels, but photon and gluons they remain massless because color symmetries and electromagnetic symmetries are unbroken in nature and you have finally one massive Higgs boson. So that completes the story of the standard model particle spectrum. So at this stage if you have any question I would like to uh, discuss them because I have already covered so many things. If you have questions just let me know. Okay, so if you have no questions, we can move further. So now, before discussing the drawbacks of the standard model, I will just request you to take a look because this is also important. When you are studying any subject, it is very important to know the historical development and the amount of effort that these great scientists have put forward to, I mean, as of now, we are talking about the beyond the standard model. But you should realize that this like extraordinary intelligent people, they have already spent their life just to develop the framework. And we are now studying the beyond the standard model. It is not that easy. In order to go beyond, you really should know what is within. Because only when you are aware of what is within and what are the drawbacks, only then you can think about why we need to go beyond. So, so these are the people who are associated with the theoretical formulation of the standard model. And as you can see, the standard model is a model which is full with novel. I mean, too many to be precise. And apart from this people, so they are mainly associated with the theories. Of course, on top of uh, you have these three gentlemen who are associated with the formation of the standard model. And you know that the Steven Weinberg, he, he passed away just one month back. And then you have Gross, Polizer, and Wilczek. They are associated with uh, the theory of the strong interaction and with asymptotic degrees of freedom. I don't want to discuss about them. And these two gentlemen who showed the renormalizability of the standard model, Etuft and Zeldman, and this theory of the spontaneous symmetry breaking and other things, thanks to scientists like Nambu. And then these are the people who are associated with the Higgs mechanism, because these are the people who wrote those incredible paper during 1964. And that's how we have our Higgs mechanism as of now. And on top of that, you should also pay, I would say request like respect to these people who again spend their life to discover the world of the elementary particle. And you can see that it is, or it was indeed an incredible journey. It started with Professor J.J. Thompson in 1897 when he discovered the electron. And finally, at 2012, we have our Higgs. So it's really, really, really a long journey over the centuries. So in fact, many people who are working in the direction of beyond the standard model, they are often, often you know, making a joke of this, this incredible journey just by saying this, when it took you more than 100 years to discover this, all the particle contents of the standard model. So we are sure that in another 100 years or maybe in another 200 years, we are going to discover the first evidence of the beyond the standard model theory. Well, that's jokes apart, but the reality is that discovering these elementary particles were never easy. I mean, these people, they have you know spent their lives in designing or discovering the proper techniques or the tools to discover those elementary particles. I mean, just to give you one more example, why in the context of the particle physics, apart from because I know like there is a standard problem in India, we believe that theory is like theory is not great, but you should know that theory and experiment, they are just like two rivers flowing side by side. It's like the relation between the river and the banks. So unless you have good knowledge about the theory, it is very hard to design an experiment. And unless you know what is happening in the experimental frontier, it is very, it is almost impossible for you to be a competent theorist. Just to give you one example, if you consider discovery of this W and Z at the, uh, by these two gentlemen, you know 
the Vandermeer, his background is from engineering background, but it is this gentleman who designed the or who invented the way of having this antiproton beam. So when it is about the discovery, you need active collaboration from people working in different frontier. So that is the beauty of the particle series. Well, even if we, and that is the reason why I personally believe, I know like there are several other believers like me, even if we fail to discover nothing apart from heat at the LHC, LHC itself is an engineering wonder. I mean, when you grow up and you are going to join somewhere for the PhD in Pandas Metal Lab, it is very easy to see magnetic field as high as 20 Tesla or so, very typical. But it is confined or constrained in a narrow region. But when you think about CMA or ACLA to maintain two Tesla or four Tesla, no doubt it's way less compared to the field that condensed matter people are doing. But to maintain four Tesla over that huge area, it's itself an engineering wonder. So there are plenty of things to remember. around. So thank you for your attention. That is the official end of the first part of the lecture. So now I will discuss the why should we look beyond the standard model. Of course, here I have changed the slides, uh, I mean, the title slightly. So I'm just going to ask this question that why should we look beyond the standard model? So at this point of time, if you have any questions and comments, just let me know. Because now we are going to move to the second part of the talk. Okay, if there are no questions and comments, move forward. Okay, so before we jump into the question or we, before we start answering this question that why do we need physics beyond the standard model? First of all, it is absolutely necessary to pay some attention to the great success of the standard model. So following this great scientist, Cyber, so you can see that standard model is a theory which is extremely or exorbitantly successful in explaining the elementary particle interaction. And what is the level of its success? You can see standard model, it actually predicts the, so by the way, I mean, uh, what is this quantity? I mean, just to give you uh, like a small idea of that, what we're going to discuss. So you, you know, like you can write down uh, uh, the, the the mu for the for the spin orbital motion uh, for the spin angular momentum and for the orbital angular momentum so if you do that you normally add a g factor so that g factor if you consider orbital motion it is one but if you consider spinning motion then this g factor is two so normally when you write down the interaction term of uh, this magnetic, I mean, this spin dipole with the external uh, magnetic field, you typically write down the interaction Hamiltonian as mu s dot b. And you write down mu s as g s uh, and then s, the, the, the spin divided by this twice m like this. So this g s factor is actually two, but it turns out that is true in the context of the quantum mechanics. But when you are going to do in the regime of the quantum field theory, so there are some things which is known as the higher order correction. So those higher order correction will show you that it is not actually true, it is slightly greater than two. Now the question is how greater? It is slightly greater. And if you do a theoretical calculation, the value that you are going to get, it's a marginal correction compared to the quantum mechanics, but that is the success of the quantum field theory over the quantum mechanics. But more importantly, experimentally, there is a departure from that value. And what is the amount of the departure? So the amount of the departure as of the 2019 data is of the order of 10 to the power minus 11. It's incredible. So if, and this is a kind of burning example of the fact that how successful the standard model really is as a theory. So the prediction of the standard model is so robust that even you need to design an experiment 
which is actually giving you a defect element with the standard model, but that is of the order of 10 to the power minus 11. So this is indeed incredible. And since I just, and this MU is defined like this, as I just mentioned, that if you go into the regime of the quantum field theory, there is the G is no longer two. In the quantum mechanics, G is equal to two, and you will end up with getting MU is equal to zero, but it is not equal to two in the quantum field theory regime. And that is the reason people normally calculate this. And the motivation of doing this thing is just to cross check whether standard model is the ultimate. This is one of the pro of the standard model, whether this is the ultimate theory or you need to go beyond. And since I just mentioned about this thing, those of you who are interested, you should know that very recently in the April, I think if I'm not making a mess, probably on the 7th of April, 2021 this year, the Fermi National Act, uh, Accelerator Laboratory, that is the FNAL, they have discovered, uh, I mean, they have measured the G minus two for the neon, and they have realized that there is a four minus two sigma deviation, as I have shown here from the standard model prediction, which is as close as five sigma. But of course, if it is not five sigma, then in, I mean, you know, the particle physicists, they, do, they don't prefer to call it a kind of discovery. So before I move further, just to give you this thing, so this one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma, they are the standard, uh, you know, discovery potential. I mean, that is how you can uh, interpret the, 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 the statistics in terms of the particle physics language. So one sigma discovery means there is a, I mean, there is a 68 point some percent, so it's roughly 68% probability that your observation is correct, but there is 32% possibility that your, your answer for your discovery is wrong. And if it is five sigma, so that means it is 99.99957, something like this. So it is not guaranteed that it is not a mistake, but the chances are very low. And as you can see that after doing, I mean, after observing this huge discrepancy of 4.2 sigma, which is very close to 99%. I mean, these people, they have also discovered that what are the chances of interpreting this observation as a statistical fluctuation, and that is one in 40,000. So you can see how incredible true these are. But apart from doing this monkey business with the number, there is a, there is a more important take home message. You see the difference. The difference is of the order of 10 to the power minus 11 that immediately gives you this idea, even if, even if we have physics beyond the standard model, either it is very heavy, so that its effect is minimal, or it is not that heavy, but it is really, really weakly coupled with the standard model, so that the observational effect of the BSM physics while cross-checking some of the SM prediction or expectation are really, really small. And these are the things which we would explore in greater details in the final lecture. So moving further, the first problem that I would like to discuss in the context of the standard model, I mean, why we need to move beyond the standard model is the neutrino mass. And this is probably the most important example. Why? Because we have already discovered neutrino oscillation, a phenomenon which is impossible with massless neutrino. So what are the, the motivation or what are the idea of the neutrino oscillation? It seems that if you remember few slides that we have introduced that these neutrinos are appearing family-wise. So there is one electron neutrino, one neon neutrino, one tau neutrino, but it turns out that these neutrinos, they oscillate. So for example, if at some instant, say if at 12 p.m. today, you have a neon neutrino, maybe at 12 p.m. tomorrow, you are going to see a tau neutrino instead of that. So the fact that they can change their flavor from neon neutrino to tau neutrino to tau neutrino to electron neutrino is known as the neutrino oscillation. And as we will see in the course of this lecture that such oscillations, it is impossible with massless neutrino. Now, that's a problem because to start with, as we have seen in the original standard model, 
the neutrinos were exactly massless. And why? Because if I try to generate neutrino masses, just like the way we were generating masses for other leptons and quarks, then we need right-handed neutrinos or neutrinos with right-handedness. But as of now, it's just a hypothesis. We haven't discovered right-handed neutrinos. So that means I cannot write down a mass term for the neutrinos the way we can write down mass terms for leptons and quarks. So in a nutshell, using Higgs mechanism, I cannot reproduce neutrino masses. So first of all, not only neutrino masses is an example or a burning proof of physics beyond the standard model, then neutrino mass generation mechanism is clearly beyond the standard model. And on 2025, so these are the gentlemen who actually were awarded with the Nobel Prize for their uh, for the experimental discovery of the neutrino oscillation. But surprisingly, the theory was formulated long, long back. It was formulated in 1957 by Bruno Pontecorvo, and later it was supported or augmented by Magi, Nagakawa, and Sakata. So now let us try to see <clears throat> what is neutrino oscillation and why it is a problem. To understand that, first let us try to see two common sources and then we are going to see that what is this so-called neutrino oscillation problem. It turns out the sun, it is actually a source of electron tribe neutrino because of the underlying PP cycle. So I'm not going to go into the details, but roughly what is happening as schematically shown. So the protons, they're converted into helium. And as a result, you have positron emission, which are written by E plus, the antiparticle of the electron, and the electron tripe neutrino. And you see now the importance of the lepton number conservation in this detail. Because it is positron, I am having electron tripe neutrino. Whereas, if you go back and if you remember the incident of the beta decay, when one neutron was decaying into one proton, so there we have electron, and that's why we have anti-electron neutrino. Now, forget about this at the moment. So normally what I would expect that when these neutrinos, they are traveling all the way through from sun to the earth space detector. Of course, detecting neutrinos are very challenging because you know they are very light and they interact very feebly. So I need to put a lot of mass in the path because if someone is interacting very you know weakly, then I have to put more and more masses in its path so that even if the interaction is very feeble, but because of the huge amount of mass, the overall interaction rate will appear sizable. Now it turns out that this is precisely how they're interacting. They come to the R, they have detection with some nuclei, and this is going to give you some electron and the either converted nuclei or recoiling of nuclei, whatever. And I'm going to detect this electron. So if I can measure their energy and everything, then I can actually have information about those electron type nitrogen. But it turns out the theoretical calculation and the experimental observation, there is a huge mismatch. And what is that? It says, when you compare these two things, the theoretical calculation and the experimental observation, it appears that there is a two-third discrepancy. So it turns out that as if only one-third of the electron neutrino are reaching Earth. So the question is that, what happens to remaining two-thirds? Someone eating them? or they are simply lost. So this apparent discrepancy was classified as the solar neutrino problem. And thanks to three gentlemen, Michaels, Manas, and Wolfenstein, so they have discovered something called the MSW effect. And that is the best explanation as of now to explain the solar neutrino oscillation. In a similar way, the cosmic rays are there because they are coming from all over the, the universe. Now, typically the cosmic rays, I mean, you have a lot of fire. Now, 
one typical decay mode of this pion, this is something that you have studied in your uh, nuclear physics and particle physics course. So a pion can decay into muon and muon tried neutrino. And the muon can further undergo a three body decay. Of course, uh, these are uh, written a bit uh, loosely, not consistent with the individual family electron number conservation, but because this pi may be pi plus and pi minus. So the muons may be also mu plus and mu minus, and consequently, the, uh, the corresponding type of neutrino may be a neutrino or maybe an anti neutrino. So, anyway, whatever it is, to start with, the muons, I mean, the pions, are, sorry, the pions are decaying into muon and muon type neutrino. But later, the muon is undergoing a three body decay and giving you one more muon neutrino and electron type neutrino. So, if I consider one decay chain, starting from pi n to here, to the level of this muon decay, I would expect two muon neutrino and one electron neutrino. So the ratio should be roughly of the order of two. Some of them may get absorbed and lost and all that thing. But when we detect this neutrino flavors, at some after this experiment, the number is not actually two. It is way smaller than that. Once again, the same question, what is happening? Something is wrong. And this, particular glitches in the measurement is relevant or known as the atmospheric neutrino oscillation. So these are just two examples, solar neutrino problem and atmospheric neutrino problem. So this simply gives you this idea that something is wrong with this flavor conversion. So we are, so especially when they're traveling and over a large distance, that is the most important thing. When neutrinos are traveling a large distance and reaching the detector, the amount of expected flavor is completely different from that what I would expect that if I have, uh, I, I have a chance to measure at the origin. So this is known as the, I mean, so something is wrong. Now, the question that scientists have asked with this observation that why we are losing certain types or what are happening. So if you move forward with this idea, so it turns out that as if these neutrinos are like the Bogart of the Harry Potter world. So just exactly the way the Bogart used to change their shape, depending on what is your greatest fear. So starting from spider for Ron to <clears throat> Professor Snape for Living Long Bottom and finally this mentor for Harry. So just like that, the neutrinos are actually changing their flavors. Now, how to understand these flavor oscillations using the simple knowledge of quantum mechanics, and that is what we plan to do here. Before that, one thing is really important that neutrinos are something which is extremely important for particle physics. Why? Because they are everywhere. So, and not only they're everywhere, the ranges over which you can expect neutrino energies is abnormal. Starting all the way from 10 to the power minus six electron volt to you can have energies of the order of 10 to the power 18 electron volt. It's an exorbitantly large, it's an exorbitantly large range. And they're everywhere. For example, if you consider very light neutrinos, so they are actually from the time of the Big Bang. And that is extremely important as I will discuss in the next slide. Then when you have uh, energies of the order of electron volt or a few electron volt, then you have basically solar neutrino, terrestrial neutrino, reactor neutrino. You go higher, you have neutrinos from the supernova. And in fact, supernova neutrinos are very special as you will learn later because the other sources like the atmosphere, the solar, the big bang, uh, the accelerator, they typically always produce certain particular flavors of neutrinos. But in that respect, supernovas are the best source because they can produce all possible neutrino flavors. So in a sense, they are probably the best natural source to get neutrinos of all possible flavors. And if you move all the way, finally you have cosmic neutrinos, which are very high energetic. In fact, there are dedicated detectors like ice cube and so, where you can measure this kind of extragalactic neutrinos. It is not clear as of now that what are 
the sources of this exorbitantly high energy. And below, I actually gave you the names of all the experiments. And if you can see that that immediately gives you this idea, especially this is something that you can use to decide your future career. You can see that numerous number of experiments are going on across the world to study neutrino properties. Because as of now, this is the only verified hint that we need to extend physics beyond the standard model. Others we have hint, but not discovered. But neutrino oscillation is something which is a discovered phenomenon. And the more important thing is that here we can really apply the make in India logic because we, in India, we have our own neutrino detector that is a part of the INO, the India based neutrino observatory. So, where we can actually have better information about the atmospheric neutrinos. So, this is located in the south of India, uh, a mountain near Uti, and it's still not fully operational, but we hope to have some good news soon. And another important thing is that, that why it is so, I mean, why there are so many experiments. If you compare this with the LH, you see when it's about the particle accelerator, we typically always, uh, you know, having one or two accelerator or such kind of collision experiment across the global. The reason is twofold. First, it is super expensive to build a collider. Neutron experiments compared to that, way more cheaper. Second is that because the variety of this neutrino or the, the range of the neutrino energy, it is an exorbitant variation. So you need to, it is very difficult to design one detector which can capture the entire energy range. That is the reason why we have different detectors or different experiment which is dedicated for a particular purpose. And also on top of that, the interaction is extremely frivolous. So as I just give you an information that out of 10 to the power 22, only one is interacting. So you can understand that if you want to feel 10,000 neutral interaction, you can have a guess that you should have an exorbitant amount of matter in the pathway of neutrino. So that is why the popular uh, neutrino detector materials are heavy water, where normally you detect through the Cherenkov radiation, or uh, as we are actually using in India, so we are actually using solid iron detector because iron is a very dense object. So I would expect more neutrino interaction as they are crossing those iron strip. And for example, trillions of neutrinos are crossing our body as of now, but we can't feel them. But if trillions of bullets were crossing in your body, then we are no longer here. So before moving, as I just mentioned, that the neutrinos associated with the Big Bang are very important. Because all of you have probably you know, studied or heard about this work, CMB, which is known as the cosmic microwave background. So this is uh, some photons which actually got decoupled from the, from the rest of the universe long, long, of the order of 4 into 10 to the power 5 years ago, to be precise, 3 lakhs and 80,000 years ago. And that's an important proof. We have detected CMB. We have now, now people are doing more sophisticated measurement like studying the CMB anisotropy and things like that to get more and more advanced information. But if you take a look at this history of evolution, it is actually under the one second after the Big Bang where these neutrinos, they got decoupled. And this particular thing is known as the CMB or C new B, that is the cosmic neutrons background. And it is way more older than the cosmic microwave background. But it is a fact, but as of now, we are just trying to detect this particular thing. Why? As you can clearly see, and as I also showed during the last slide, that their energy is extremely low. So they are very, very hard to detect. And in fact, there is one detector, which is at the Princeton, which is the Princeton Titrium Observatory. <coughs> to detect those early universe massive neutrino yield, uh, 
effort and that is actually precisely going to go through this channel but as of now it is not fully operational so by 2022 we hope to have some first set of data or first set of results from this experiment so that definitely be a kind of remarkable advancement because we have already gathered so much information about the, the history of the universe evolution through the cm but it is only 3,000, uh, 3 lakhs and 80000 years old if compared to that if we came to know about something which happened just one second after the big bang then you can clearly understand that the amount of information that you can extract from that observation so that is also better understanding about the neutrinos are extremely important even for the people who are doing research in cosmology or astroparticle physics or things like that so now <clears throat> What about neutrino oscillation and how neutrinos are changing their types during the motion so before moving further i would just like to give you a very stupid and i would say a very naive example so that even a person with the basic understanding of the vector calculus can understand so you just consider two arbitrary vectors a and b and i am for the moment considering a two-dimensional plane so theta is definitely omega t so I have say two vectors A and B, which are measured at say theta is equal to 60 degree. Now, if I remeasure them again at 150 degree, so it turns out that now my A vector is like the B vector and my B vector is like the negative of the A vector. So what is the reason behind this apparent change? A goes to B and B goes to minus A. It is the time evaluation. So if I observe something at certain instance and then at a later instance, then I can see that at least they are changing into one another. This is, as I said, a very simple example just for the school level uh, student. But this is the very basic idea of the neutrino oscillation. So now moving a rather realistic example. Now I go to the kingdom of the quantum mechanics. So first consider a two-level quantum mechanical system. So this picture is equivalent to a two-flavor neutrino oscillation. That's what I consider two-level system. Of course, if it is quantum mechanics, then you need to start studying the equation. You solve the equation, you get the energy eigenfunction and eigenvalues, and you know that how they are evolving in the Schrodinger equation with this uh, with the corresponding energy. And of course, I'm working in the natural energy system. So suppose now this new one and new two as you know they are basically the energy eigenstate and they are orthonormal to each other but what i can do i because they are energy eigenstate so you know i mean consider particle in a box n is equal to one and n is equal to two they are completely different i cannot express n is equal to two and n is equal to one so clearly those states new one and new two labeled by new one and new two they are not the observed or the flavored state. They are definitely mass or energy eigenstate, something that cannot change into one another. What I can do, just like this previous vectorial example, I can consider using the basic principle of the quantum mechanics that any arbitrary state can be expressed as a linear combination of the complete orthonormal state of any system. So I'm actually writing two arbitrary wave function new denoted as new A and new B in terms of new one and new two. And this is just nothing but a simple two-dimensional rotation. This is how you have studied this relation between I cap, J cap to I J if you rotate Y to X prime, Y prime. And, but now new one and new two, they have time evaluation. So because as new A is a linear combination of new one and new two, they will also have a time evolution. And that is precisely how I, we can write down new A at a later time T as cos theta. And then this Schrodinger factor is the power minus IU1 T times new one and also new. But what is the motivation of that? Now the question that I would like to ask that we know new one it will remain new one forever. It may have time evolution, but it will never become new two. But is there a possibility 
that new A gets converted into new B. It turns out there is a possibility. How? To calculate this possibility, you know, normally we just do this shyster shy kind of thing, and this is exactly what I am doing. And the corresponding probability, if you do this calculation, it will give you a quantity like this sine square of OS theta 1 minus 4 e2 minus u1. Now, as of now, we don't have any clue. But it is true that so there is a there is a chance in, in even if you consider a simple two-dimensional quantum mechanical system, that there is a possibility that if you start with some new A at some later instant of time, you can get a new sign. All mathematics. But this particular formula, if I take a look, although I wrote this thing that messages for massless neutrinos, but it is not apparently clear. I mean, I don't see anything that which can actually guarantee or assure me that uh, this is indeed the phenomenon. Of course, in deriving these things, you have to do a little bit of algebra. I have used this Euler's formula and the orthonormality condition of the, um, of the eigenfunctions, which is similar to that the vector dot product. In order to understand that, what you have to do, you have to do a little more expansion. And you have to use that neutrinos are almost massless in nature. You have to do a little bit of calculation. And they are traveling almost at a space close to the speed of light, not at the speed of light, because they're at the end of the day, they are having masses, all the very tiny, but it's a non-zero quantity. If you actually put that quantity, then this simple relation E1, E2 minus E1, it actually reduces like this. And now you see that if you put M1 and M2 is equal to zero, so you have cos zero. So what is cos zero? That is one. So one minus one, zero. So the probability of transition from new A to new B at a later state of time is zero if you have a massless neutron. So that is the important thing. So first lesson that we can see that massless neutrino, no oscillation. Massive neutrinos, oscillation. And second, the factor which is appearing with this cost term is m2 square minus m1 square, not m2 square or not m1 square individually. So the second take home message is that probability of neutrino oscillation is sensitive to the mass square difference, not the mass scale. So this is one important observation because many times when you do this exercise, you have this idea that neutrino oscillation is also the reason by which you can prove the neutrino mass. Neutrino oscillation is just a confirmation that neutrinos are massive in nature. And the only information you can extract from oscillation experiment is that you can calculate the mass square difference. So if you consider the three flavor oscillations, so you can calculate m3 square minus m2 square or m2 square minus m1 square or m3 square minus m2. But it is not apparent what are MIs. And that is something that is surprising that neutrino oscillation doesn't really predict that neutrinos are going to have tiny masses, although we have used this information. Because even if you consider things at 100 GeV and say 100.01235 GeV, you can still do this square and you can differentiate, uh, sorry, not the differentiate, you can take their differences and you can actually reproduce this measured mass square difference. They're actually very tiny. One is of the order of 10 to the power minus three electron volt square square because we are talking about mass square and the other is even smaller, 10 to the power minus five electron volt square. So oscillation doesn't give you any information about the individual neutron mass. But while deriving the oscillation formula, we have used this information. That information is actually coming from cosmological flow. So there are certain flows like baryon acoustic oscillations and things like that. That actually gives you an idea about the sum of the three neutrino masses. So which is, as you can see, it's very small of the order of 0.1 electron volt. So it's very, very small. So whatever be your individual neutrino masses, the sum cannot be more than that. So because the sum is so tiny, so it is natural to expect that the individual masses are also very, very small. 
So you can, in fact, extend this idea. So if you actually go here and try to take a look, you know, I can actually write down this as a matrix because this cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta, I mean, I can actually club them together and write them as a two cross two matrix. So I can write down this new, new A, new B as a two cross one column matrix. This factor as a two cross uh, two uh, matrix and new one and new two as once again as a two cross one column matrix. And then I can rewrite this entire thing as a as a symbolic equation where each entries are some component of the matrix. So here exactly I have applied this idea. So if I go to the three flavor case, so of course, if you compare this with the previous example, then this is the flavor. This is the flavor index. This is the mass index and this is the mass index. So basically if you make a one-on-one -on -one mapping from this to that for the two flavor case, then U11 or E1 will be your cos theta, E2 will be your sine theta and things like that. And starting from here, you can again calculate the probability of transition between new A to new B. And now you can see it is really complicated. So, but once again, it is once again sensitive to the mass square differences and not to the actual masses. And if you are interested or if you are keen, you can just go back and read, calculate these things in the context of two flavor case. And you can see that you're going to reproduce the older result, this. So mass phase neutrinos are essential to assure neutrino oscillation. But there is a bigger problem. Why? So if you actually now calculate, so these are what? So if you remember, the basic idea of the quantum mechanics. This is like, so when you write down any arbitrary wave function in terms of the eigenwave function, we normally write psi as a sum of ci psi i. So this ci is like the weightage or the, the prefactor, which actually determines the weightage because the weightage is typically given by the mod square. So basically these u alphas are also serving the similar purpose. But the problem is that what you can see that this is the a schematic representation based on the actual data that we have from the oscillation. So it turns out that if I do one-on-one uh, -on -one connection between the flavor states and the massive states, although I wrote this in a very schematic way, but this actually determines the size of the composition. So this is nothing but the size of UE1. This is UE2 and this is UE3. So it turns out that the composition is really, really not uniform. Somehow in U, somehow in electron flavor neutrino, it is actually getting the highest contribution from the first mass eigenstate, where the contribution from the third eigenstate is practically negligible. If I go to the second one, that is the muon neutrino, it seems the weightage of the second types and the third types, they are more or less the same. And if I go to the third one, that is the tau neutrino, here it is true that the third one is a little bit bigger, but still more or less comparable. But the extreme situation is actually true for the <coughs> electron neutrino case. So this mixing matrix is highly inhomogeneous. When you are going to learn the actual particle physics, you are going to see there exists a similar mix, mixing matrix also in the context of the quarks. But that matrix is rather as expected. So there, when you consider the diagonal entries, that is basically uh, how, I mean, what you would expect naively that electron type should have maximum contribution from the type one, the, the, the first one, the muon neutrino should have maximal from the second one and the tau should have maximum from the third one. So the corresponding uh, matrix, if you work out for the quark sector, it has exactly the same structure. I'm sorry, I don't want to show it here. And that is and that particular matrix is known as the Kabibo-Kuawashi-Masakawa matrix or known as the CKM matrix. 
but that is completely different here. And this matrix is known as the PMNS matrix after this four gentlemen who discovered these things, Ponte Corvo, Maki, Nakakawa, Sakata. Just like the CK is named after the person who discovered it. So this is also another puzzle that why the mixing or the compositions are drastically different in order. And precisely the way I have shown in, I'm sure that some of you are interested and will go and study further. This is a typical example of the tri by maximum. Why? Because here you can see two of them are of equal size. But this was before uh, 2012 when we, but now we have a better idea about the, the oscillations parameter and which I will discuss in detail again in the third exam, in the in the third slide. But this model is no longer, it, it's little bit in uh, like endangered as of now. So now I give you a, a pictorial example of what actually happens in the context of the neutrinos. So what is the absolute neutrino mass scale? We have no idea. We just know the position of the different things. Another important thing is that since we know only the mass square differences, as of now, the difference between the second and the one, it is uniquely determined with the sign. Thanks to this MSW effect, which I just mentioned, I'm not going to go into details. That is 10 to the power minus five electron volt square of that order, and that is positive. But the sign of the other mass square difference, which is known as the, okay, why it is called solar mass square difference? Because it was discovered or it was predicted, I mean, probed using the solar neutrino oscillation. The other one is probed through the atmospheric neutrino oscillation. So it is known as the atmospheric mass square difference. That is of the order of 10 to the power minus three electron volt square. But the problem is, for this, there is a sign ambiguity. This may be plus, this may be minus. The consequence of that thing is that we know that second mass eigenstate will always lie on top of the first mass eigenstate because m square two one minus m square one is always positive. But we can't say the same for m square three. It may be on top or it may be on below. So when it is on top, you have three two one which is as expected, or one to three. So this is known as the normal ordering of neutrino masses. If I go to the other one, then three, because of the sign ambiguity, may also lies below. But now two, one, three, a break of chain. So it is known as the inverted hierarchy. So because of the sign ambiguity, apart from the fact that one absolute neutrino mass is not known, it is also not known to us that what is the correct neutrino mass ordering, normal hierarchy or inverted hierarchy. So the echo message or the question <coughs> that you can ask from the neutrino oscillation that compared to the quark sector, why these mixings are so non-homogeneous? I mean, as you can see here. So here, if you consider M3, you see there is hardly any electron level composition. And that is also obvious from here, because in the electron neutrino, the contribution from the third mass, I guess it is practically negligible. So if you have a way to invert this matrix, it will be just the opposite. So also in the composition of the third mass eigenstate, the composition of this uh, electron flavor will be negligible. And that is precisely what you can see in this diagram. The second thing is that how exactly we should extend the standard model to generate neutrino masses. Because as of now, we have no experimental observation about the right-handed neutrino. Is it right-handed neutrino or is it something else? And that is the reason why we have a plethora of neutrino mass models. The most standard models are known as the CISO models because as you can see, Neutrino masses are very tiny in nature as you have realized during the course of this lecture. And typically when something is very light, we always believe that it's a kind of CISO mechanism. So because something is so heavy, that is why something other which is sitting here is so light. And this, the one which is sitting here is so heavy. And because this guy which is sitting here is so heavy, we can't detect this as of now without experimental proof. For example, there exists certain neutrino mass model where the right-handed neutrino mass says 
are of the order of 10 to the power 16 to 18 gene. Now, if you consider LHC, it's a TV scale collider. How on earth I can prove a 10 to the power 16 GV object using LHC? We can't. So, if that is the correct model of neutrino physics, then we have absolutely no way to probe it or to discover right-handed neutrinos directly. But of course, in order to ameliorate this uh, this hindrance, people have designed other models where the right-handed neutrinos are in the around the TV scale. But the problem is that they are interacting very weakly with the rest of the standard model. So once again, as of now, we have no experimental discovery. So there are a class of models like CISO type 1, CISO type 2, CISO type 3, linear CISO, double CISO, inverse CISO, a lot. But because we neutrino oscillation observational set, neutrino mixing angles. So mixing angles means numerical estimations of these sizes. Done. But as of now, we really don't know which is the correct model because every single model of neutrino masses, there are at least one or more BSN ingredients or fields which are yet to be discovered. That is the reason why we have so many models. And also, it is important that how one should assure such tiny neutrino masses. So that is another problem. In the standard model, if you remember uh, the one of the slides, I actually showed there there is a huge mass hierarchy. Now, this mass hierarchy is also very hard to digest because why the way Higgs is coupling to the electron and the way Higgs is coupling to the top quark is so difficult. We apparently have no idea. But you can say that, okay, this is because the nature is perverted and the Yukawa couplings, the Yukawa coupling, which determine the, the coupling strength between one elementary fermion and the Higgs, is of that order. But because Higgs is not the one which is giving mass to the tiny neutrinos, so how on earth you, you can assure such a tiny neutrino masses? No clue. And there are more, you know, mechanisms like can we treat neutrinos as a dark matter? Of course, there are models where people have tried to treat neutrinos as a dark matter, both left-handed and the right-handed. Problem is that if you believe the neutrinos, the light one, which I mentioned, like which actually ex uh, exhibit neutrino oscillations, if you think about them as a dark matter, the problem is that they are very light. And because they are very light, you are going to have other astrophysical uh, complication like structure formation, uh, galaxy formation, large scale structure, and things like that, which is in the scope of this talk. But heavy neutrinos, on the other hand, they are eligible candidate for the dark matter. But because we haven't observed the right-handed neutrinos as of now, so it's just a pure hypothesis. And the most important question, neutrinos are the only elementary fermion in the standard model which is electrically neutral. So is it possible that we can treat a neutrino as its antiparticle? We can do it for photon because photon is electrically neutral. So if you believe that a particle can be treated as its own antiparticle, it has to be neutral. If you want to treat electron, it's impossible because it is carrying electric charge. So now my question to all of you, because I don't want to go into further details of the other slide, we'll discuss on the next day, the other problems on the standard model. So I would like to ask this question that do you believe that it is possible for the neutrino to be its antiparticle because it is electrically neutral? Any answer? Anyone? Actually, if you believe in the standard model, then you really can't. Because if you remember, initially associated a quantity with the lepton family, which is known as the lepton number, be it family wise or be it total. Now, if you believe a neutrino, is acting like its own antiparticle. So that means you are actually equating 
left turn number one is equal to left turn number minus one. The moment you start doing that, that means you believe that the left turn number is no longer a valid symmetry in the standard model. So it is just like you know, adding a x cube term and claiming that x two minus x is the real. It's impossible. Same here. But it turns out, unfortunately, in the standard model, it's a consequence of the mathematical construction of the mathematical beauty of the standard model. Left turn number and the Baryon number that is associated with the protons and neutrons. There comes up if you consider the phenomenology of the standard. So in the original standard model, left turn number violation is not possible. So neutrino, as of the original standard model, cannot be treated as its own antiparticle. However, there exist beyond the standard model theories where lepton numbers are broken and there you can actually treat neutrino as its own antiparticle. And that actually opens up a new kingdom of research where you can do several new things. You can study flavor violating processes or things like that. Some of them I will discuss uh, during the next class. So before, because it is already 1 p.m. So I would like to stop here and uh, time for questions. Okay, so we will uh, open the floor for questions now. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Any? So, uh, so I can see some questions. Uh, uh, in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. So uh, look at these questions and. Yes, yes. Okay, so Asha, so first of all, there were two questions. I don't know, they are also here. So last day for the for the time I didn't. So there was one question about the graviton and the GR. So I would like to define that how do you actually get photons? Only when you can quantize certain theory, you can have a quantum particle which is transmitted that interaction. But as I mentioned, and you can see that in the standard model, we have embedded electromagnetic weak and the strong interaction but not the gravity because as of now we don't when I mean, we don't have a complete formulation of the gravity as a quantum field theory or as a gauge theory so unless you quantize that i mean how you can actually identify the quanta of this particle if we can quantize gravity then of course graviton will be the would be the name of that particle which is going to mediate that thing. that is one Achha. second there was one question about the heating of the dark matter from sun Indeed, there are possibilities, but this is one of the rather recent trend in the, in the research. I mean, I have never worked on that, but there are a few uh, interesting research paper which people wrote during 2020 and 2021. So, because there are uh, certain example or certain uh, models where you consider dark matter inside the sun and they have this kind of distribution, but I have never worked in those areas. But if you are interested you can get my email from the organizers and if you just send me an email i can share those articles with you but i'm not uh, a kind of person who can discuss more about that thing because i have never worked on those areas explicitly and then there was also a question about the electron double slit so there i'm confused you just mentioned something more about it of course if you consider the double slit ex uh, experiment with the electron I mean, it is going to give you this idea that they also exhibit the, uh, the wave-like nature. But the interesting fact is that I believe that was the essence of your question. If you uh, you know uh, start uh, uh, from any arbitrary width of the slide, you can see as long as the slide is uh, rather wide, then of course you cannot uh, get the desired uh, pattern. I mean, the quantum mechanical behavior in the slit. So you will get more like the classical behavior and you can treat the electrons as the, as the classical particle. But when you are in a, in a region, when the, the, the slit width is really nearly narrow, only then you can start seeing those patterns, even with a single electron, as if part of it is interfering with that. And that is the confirmation of the <clears throat> wave nature. So what is the trick? The trick is that, of course, Doing a rough calculation is not completely correct because at the end of the day, electrons are relativistic particles, but roughly you can get, you can calculate <clears throat> the de Broglie wave associated with an electron and you can compare that wavelength with the size of the slit. Only when they are comparable, then you can see this wave phenomenon. And that is the reason, you know, people normally use uh, lattice 
or crystal lattice to study this kind of phenomena because there the inter lattice spacing is something which is of the of the order of nanometer which you can use as a kind of so this is something that actually you can treat like the waiting for electron so i don't know whether it justifies your queries but otherwise you can let me know so one question is that why shouldn't we care about axions which are not found in connection which were not found see i don't know how much you have knowledge about the axion so axion is something that you can even get in the context of the standard model you know in the standard model if you go to the strong interactions regime so since you have mentioned this i hope you have some idea about that so in the realm of the quantum chromodynamics there is a particular problem known as a strong city problem now uh one of the easy solution of the strong city problem is actually through the action so there is a belief like you can use this action as a dark matter candidate so it is not completely true when we mention that there is no standard model i mean there is no standard model candidate which can act like a dark matter but there is a problem if we believe action as a dark matter the problem <coughs> is that first of all it is very light now if it is very light then the problem that i mentioned in the context of the neutrinos probably we are going to treat it like the kind of warm or hot dark matter depending uh, which is the mass uh, which is the uh, mass region of the action in which you are working so they cannot actually give you the current history of the universe for example if they are really relativistic hot and warm or or hot or warm in nature then probably they have problem with the structure formation or the galaxy structure formation so for that you need part of the dark matter so recently there exists a kind of series of lectures where people actually consider multi component dark matter so there you can think about action a part of that thing so there are several you know interesting studies on that so uh, they are part of it maybe action and the part of it maybe the cold dark matter but how to club them together it's difficult it's not very standard so is it really possible that the multiple universe is moving in multiversal space in the speed of particle unfortunately i am not the correct person so there i mean i know there exist theories like multiverse and other things but i don't want to discuss about these things because i believe that i don't have this uh, the, the competence because i have not really work on the multiverse maybe the people who are working with the string and vacuous so they can do this uh, they can uh, have better comments because multiverse as of now i know there even exists research article like this but for me i am not also very much you know uh, flexible or convinced about those ideas but it is true that those ideas are there so then there is a question why do you particularly use iron see the thing is that iron is a very dense object so as i mentioned that when you have so suppose i give you one example suppose uh, you are going for a fishing now if you have a and you are going to fish with your net so when you are going to uh, do a fishing say for tuna which is 200 kg to 500 kg then you can use any strong net and you can grab it but suppose you are going to do a fishing which say to uh, to do a certain kind of uh, fish which is known as bumblebee which is actually this small a few centimeter then of course you need to reduce your net size if you going to do a fishing with something which is even smaller then you need to use a denser net that is exactly the philosophy that we are doing because their interactions are very weak so it is rather easy for them to escape the detection so we are actually putting more and more and more matter in their path so that <coughs> you can actually mm, slow them down and you can detect them once again another question from sourav many universes many realities how can we understand other universes and different types of particle which has the different uh, in nature honestly i don't have any answer for that question because this is something which is as of now for me this is more philosophical when I mean, what do you mean by reality i mean there is one axiom of the strings that the universe has plenty of vacuums i mean uh, but and we are sitting at one of them now how do you how do you create that one particular things as of now i don't believe that we have a clear understanding of that so i and, and what is the meaning of reality how do you define reality that is an important question
of course if you go to beyond the standard model yes hello yes no no nobody is asking i hope oh okay so it is true that the only one thing is that apart from the known particle if you go to the any beyond the standard model particles because they are extended theory so it is natural that they have more additional particles compared to the standard model and as of now we haven't discovered any of them so that is the kind of so, so but that has nothing no connection with the many universe that is our universe so if you consider any bsm theory that is beyond the standard model theory the sm must be a part of it so if you believe in that way i mean especially as a uh, so there is uh, one person i forgot his name again so he has one of this uh, yeah so he is, has a very famous article on the supersymmetry so he always used to have make this joke that who told uh, you that we haven't discovered supersymmetry we have already discovered half of it that is the standard model but that is just for joking because sm is a part of because you are extending sm to be uh, uh to fit or to accommodate any bsm theory so it is natural that sm must be the lowest lying part of those theory but there must be some other other thing for example the people who are working with the kind of uh, extra dimensional things they have something known as the kaluza klein towers of particles so they have several excited so and the sm particles are actually the the lowest one so those who are actually in scottish sir so you can actually talk to your sir uh, professor jayadev mitra because he was one who worked on this uh, extra dimensional model so this randall sundaram scenario so they have studied this kk tower kind of thing but that is once again one universe not about the many universe with many realities <laughs> so if you have any other questions just uh, feel free okay uh, i hope there are no no other questions in the chat box so i have a question so you yes. have said that you have said that uh, neutrinos have a uh, different origins right yes uh, so detecting a uh, neutrinos on the earth is it possible to know the origin that is definitely possible uh, joita ji if but you need to measure the energy very accurately for example as i just showed you so so uh, as of now so there is one uh, ice cube experiment so so they are actually so they have detected some neutrinos which actually carries exorbitant amount of energy so the, they call i mean there are something they call glasor resonance and that thing so there are you know experiments where they have detected some neutrinos with very high energy so that is there and they have also detected uh, in other experiment they have also detected neutrinos where the energies are very small for example in the ballpark of ev or so the like the atmospheric neutrinos but as of now it is not clear that what are the precise origin of those extra galactic neutrinos with super high energy but they have been detected i mean but not in in a great number i mean because we haven't detected ample of them okay uh, i mean energy is the key uh, energy yeah, of mean, the yeah. particles exactly because unless you actually get the energy of the particle you have no i mean you cannot see that how it was exactly produced okay 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 so uh, if anybody can ask any question uh, you can unmute and ask directly otherwise <coughs> we can end the session I think no more questions are there. Okay, so so today we end here, Pradipto. And another okay. thing, last questions were asked by Dr. Shubha Shamonto, oh. uh, faculty ah. of our department. Ah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> ah, you know, I, I got confused. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. My apology. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh no! <laughs> Since you were speaking, I thought it's <laughs> you. Just sorry. Okay, okay. So today we end here, and we will meet again. next saturday at 11 okay? okay okay thank you very much okay thank, thank you. you so much pradeep